Hey, it's Larry. Uh, thanks for listening. Happy New Year. Real quick, before we get into this episode, I had such an amazing, eye-opening, life-changing experience at the World Parkinson Congress in Kyoto that I want others to have that opportunity, too. So Becca Miller and I and 24 of our PD community friends have launched a year-long WPC Travel Grant Fundraiser. We're each doing a two-week Facebook fundraiser. Mine's underway right now because my birthday's January 9th. All the money raised will be used to help offset travel costs so more people with young-onset Parkinson's can attend the next WPC in Barcelona in 2022. You can search out details on the When Life Gives You Parkinson's Facebook page or donate directly to the WPC website. Go to wpc2022.org slash yopdfund. If you or your business would like to supply matching funds... Hey, good on you. Email me at parkinsonspod at curiouscast.ca. And now, on with the show. Hi, my name is Larry Gifford. I have Parkinson's disease. What do you do about it? Apparently exercise. 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 Ugh. This is When Life Gives You Parkinson's. Joining me on this podcast journey is producer and reporter, Nikki Reitmeyer. We've been doing the podcast for a while, and I've known you, Larry, for several years. I somehow get the sense that exercise isn't really your jam, so to <laughs> what, speak. What, what makes you feel that way? Uh, exercise and I, let's say we have an adversarial relationship. <laughs> uh, think back to one of the earlier episodes of the podcast. Uh, remember what my mom said. It didn't matter to me that you were never as coordinated as the other children. They yeah. were very involved in sports and team sports. And you tried them all, and I watched and severed through them all. <laughs> <laughs> but you were not athletic. You just didn't have that coordination that the rest of them had. So you've never really been athletic. Never. We, you know, and I, I think about it like, why? Why Why have I never been athletic? And it's never been enjoyable for me. Like, I always found it to be like, I was just sore afterwards. I never felt like that runner's high or anything. And, and then I thought about it some more. And I was like, oh, you know what? My brothers were really athletically inclined. My sister was athletically inclined. And I needed to differentiate myself. I was the baby of the family. So every time I got to, like, junior high school or high school, I was so-and-so's little brother. All right. And so I needed to define who I was. So I went to the music and the theater and ultimately radio and announcing. Uh, that, was, that was where I was going to make my name and how I was going to define who I was. And so in doing that, I said, well, they're athletes. Right. I won't be. Yeah. And so there may be still, you know, at 46 years old, this mental block that yeah. I don't want to do that. So now you're at a point in your life, though, where you have to get over that mental block on doctor's orders. Yeah. Uh, and, and from day one of this diagnosis, August 2017, my neurologist, Dr. Jonathan Squires, has told me, you got to exercise. Um, the only thing that we know so far that slows the progression of Parkinson's disease is physical activity. It does help control the symptoms and it does help slow the progression as far as we know. So it's, it's very important. Right now, the, it's really just all theoretical as to what the benefits of exercise are. But there's an increasing body of evidence, both in humans and animal models, that show that exercise does make a difference. In, in some ways, I feel like all the medications that we use are really just to enable people to exercise because that's the best treatment that we have right now. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Yes. Isn't that so fascinating that he talks about how the best treatment is, in fact, exercise? And when he talked about the medications, you know, we often think of medication as being an alternative to doing something physical. But in this case, he said the medication is what allows you to do the physical, which ultimately could be the cure. Which is insane that I'm taking medicine so I can exercise more. <laughs> it's like, wait a second, can't I just take a pill and be done with it? Isn't you know, it either or? Isn't there an injection or <laughs> can I have a lobotomy or something? <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, uh, now I got to figure out what I'm going to do. Like, uh, the, the reality is I have Parkinson's. And so if, right. I, if I'm, if I'm going to live a happy life, if I'm going to live a productive life, if I, if I want to stave off these symptoms, 
I got to find my exercise. And so that's, that's what I'm committed to doing. All right. <clears throat> so uh, we've arrived at the uh, Parkinson's Wellness Center where I'm going to try boxing for the first time. <laughs> this should be interesting. I don't know if I'm prepared for this, but it's going to be an hour of my life that will make me better, I told. <laughs> uh, so we'll see. My wife, Rebecca, and I are at Impact Parkinson's, Mind, Body, Soul, Parkinson's Wellness Center in New Westminster, British Columbia. The gym is in a strip mall. It used to be a wine store. The sign still hangs above the front door. A group of ladies greets us at the front door, and there's one voice that rises above the rest. Okay, let's go. That voice belongs to Robin Morell. She's certified and trained in rock steady boxing, which is the boxing program most associated with Parkinson's. And when you went to the training, what did you learn about how boxing can help Parkinson's? Um, watch behind you. <laughs> um, a boxer trains, uh, everything that a boxer does for training really works on all the different symptoms of Parkinson's. So you've got your footwork, your hand-eye coordination, your balance, you've got cognitive, you've got speed, all of that type of thing. And they can all relate somehow to all the different symptoms of Parkinson's. Wow. So that's why they, it's, it's the, the boxing is the most researched sport exercise for people with Parkinson's and it's what they have found that is that works the best. And what do you what do you see in your own experience as you're, as you're meeting people with Parkinson's and taking the boxing? Yeah. How does it change that? It gives them a lot more confidence. That's one I think that's the biggest thing that I see. Um, there was a time when I was doing assessments, and it still happens. Um, somebody's wife or husband or daughter will bring somebody in for an assessment, and they're like, they don't want to be here. They're kicking and screaming. And they're like, oh, I don't know about this. And within three months, they're still here. Like, and they're like, some of them I can think of, but two years later, they're still here. So it's fun, it's a safe environment. Um, everybody here has Parkinson's, so they don't feel self-conscious at all. That, I think that's one of the great things. Um, built up a big family and a community. Some of them now go golfing together. Uh, they go for lunch. They go to the theater. So they've made a lot of close friends. So I think it's, I, for me, I think it's the confidence that um, lets them go out in public more if they feel like they couldn't before. Holidays? Oh, my God. They go on holidays now like you wouldn't believe. My first summer I was open, nobody took time off. And now, because of being able to move better, they feel more confident going on holidays. Mm. Oh, that's great. Going on an airplane, going on a cruise, right? All that kind yeah. of thing. I bet at this point, Larry, you're wishing that the boxing gym was still a wine store. I was looking for like a tap or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible, though, that boxing, in her opinion, seems to be the best sport for your body and also for building confidence. Well, and that's what I found throughout this, you know, this day uh, trying the boxing and the people I spoke to is like it's not just about the physical activity. They're challenging your mind, too, which is really interesting. As the class begins, everyone gathers in a circle, and she introduced me to the group. Uh, hi, thanks for letting me crash your class today. Uh, I, uh, last August, was diagnosed with Parkinson's, uh, young onset Parkinson's. I'm 46 years old. Uh, this is my wife, Rebecca. Um, and uh, I'm here for me, because I, I want to learn what this is about. Um, and I'm also here to document my experience in, in and find out other people's stories. Uh, and and I, I've been adverse to exercise my whole life, so this is really hard. Like when they said, you know, the one thing you can do is exercise, I'm like, it couldn't have been chocolate. <laughs> like, you just have to eat a lot of chocolate, it'll all go away. So uh, I'm trying to find my exercise that will help me uh, stave off Parkinson's. So this is just part of my journey. So thanks for letting me be here. Thank you, Larry. After that, Robin quickly partners me up with Sugar Jay. <laughs> Jay Siddle is 65. He was diagnosed at 53, and he's fairly new to boxing. I've been doing this for about a year and a half. Okay. And when did you get diagnosed? And I got diagnosed about 12 years ago. Okay, so do you feel this is... Oh, know, this has saved my life. Really? Absolutely. Because it really recharges your cognitive thinking. So we start with warm-ups, stretches, passing red rubber balls over our heads, backwards, side to side, between our legs. Okay. And over. Okay. You're going to do that in one direction for 30 seconds, and then you're going to reverse. Okay. 
Nikki, I got to gotta be honest. About this point, I'm like, all right, well, that was fun. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> wow. But I stick with it. Uh, there are stations all around the room. Half of them are boxing focused and half are non-boxing. So there's eye-hand coordination, cognitive exercises. So they had all the letters of the alphabet on the wall. Huh. And one of the assistants would, would uh, be standing right beside you and she'd yell out K. And so with my left hand, I'd point at the K touch the K with my hand, and then she'd write out, she'd shout out M, and I'd use my right hand, and I'd hit the M, and so you keep alternating left and right hands, and what was fascinating to me, I'm like, this is like something that a kindergartner would do, well, right? Well, that's what I'm thinking, yeah. Uh, oh, so, Parkinson's really affects the right side of my body, and it was amazing how slow I was in finding and pointing to the letters with my right hand versus my left hand. Interesting. And I'm like, wow. So then what they're trying to do is, you know, that get that neuroplasticity and just retrain your brain about those things. So it's, uh, it was it was fascinating. It really opened my eyes to like, oh, yeah. God, this is horrible. <laughs> Jeez. And it's funny how that turned out to be so much harder than it sounds. Yeah. It, it, I'm like, God, ah, this will be easy. Uh, you know, and then they did the balance thing where you had to stand on like a wobbly ball. Oh, and, yeah. You know, core exercises like planking. Ugh. Why don't we work on a plank? Okay. Okay? Ooh, I, I'd heard about it. I'd seen it on Instagram, but I'd never done it before. Just like that. We're going to hold that for a minute. Okay. <laughs> and Good luck with that. We or me? It sounds like through all of this, you're really getting in touch with your body. Oh, I hadn't thought of that, but uh, I guess so. Well, I, I, hmm, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm very aware of my body throughout this whole day. Yeah. And uh, I, I, there are moments where I'm enjoying it, just enjoying it, which I don't usually do. So that was neat because it was, it was moving by so fast, and you're doing so many different things that it was easy to get sort of caught up in the momentum. So we're at a water break. Yeah. How are you feeling? We're halfway through. Um, you know, I'm not used to moving my body like this, but, I, you know, it's it's nice. But I, I'm finding, like, I, I, I'm identifying the weaknesses. So, like, when I'm hitting the bag, like a sword, my left hand's pulling it through. So it looks like my right, when I'm swinging from my right side, it looks stronger. But that's because my left hand's doing the work. And when I'm trying to go the other way, mm-hmm. my right arm's just not pulling it through. Mm-hmm. So it's just, just like the things like that. And like when I was doing the uh, plank, my, my arm and my body started really shaking. Yeah. Um, but I do have to say, it's hard to hold a plank for 20 seconds, let alone... Well, it was, it was a, I was on my knees. Plank, yeah. yeah. But let's, let's be realistic. It wasn't a real <laughs> plank. It was a Larry plank. But it was the first time you were doing anything yeah. like that in a very long time. Yeah. This is the most you've seen me exercise in 20 years. Probably, yes. Yeah. Other than a few hikes. Yeah. Yeah. So. But it's fun. It's fun. Okay, guys. Let's see how it goes. It's at this time that we uh, focus Larry on boxing. So Robin takes some time to give me the gloves, lace up the gloves, and make sure it fits right, and, and then teach me some proper technique. So hands up, and jab, good, cross, jab, and cross. I got to hit the bag. That's fun. Feels good. Why does that feel good? I, I don't know. Just uh, getting out some frustration. Maybe I didn't know it was there. Well, I guess <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm pissed at the disease, so it's something to take it out on. Uh, and uh, I don't know. It just uh, feels feels good. Although me you know, my right hand, like look, you can see, it's shaky right now. So anytime I get extra adrenaline or get nervous or get you know emotially invested in something, uh, tremors start up. But it's, uh, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't you just it doesn't. It feels no. It doesn't feel as in control as my left. Well, I feel like Rob. So, sounds like it was a little bit harder than you thought it might be. Yeah, it it, uh, it was it was exhausting, yeah. uh, but um, not in a bad way. You know, I, I can see uh, that this this could be fun. You know, and as I try to find the things that I want to do to exercise, uh, I'd certainly cons- I'm not ruling this out for sure. Um, Jay and I reconnected at the end of the session for 
punch mitt drills, which, you know, one guy wears the boxing gloves, and then there's like almost like a catcher's mitt that you punch. Oh, okay. Yeah, like a blocker or something. Right, yeah. And so we were taking turns wearing the flat mitts while the other one punches. Reset. After the class, this was really cool. Jay went out to his car and he came back in and he presented me with a walking stick. Oh. Uh, and he goes into the woods on walks uh, with his wife and he finds sticks and he takes them home and he polishes them up and puts stoppers on the bottom and he paints them. And he painted mine like purple polka dots and stuff. Oh, and he that's goes, so This sweet. is for you. Oh. And I just met him that day. And apparently he gives out walking sticks to whoever wants them. That's really cool. What a nice guy. Yeah, no, it was great. It was uh, it was really cool. Uh, and I've met up with him several times since then, and he's just uh, a really nice man. Um, and we just sat down uh, and had a little chat about Parkinson's. It uh, hasn't been as much a challenge as most people would think, as long as you look on the bright side. Yeah. And I'm better now than I, than I was 10 years ago. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It, it's just, what do you credit that to? Hard work and having a good health support staff. Yeah, yeah I watch my diet, calf, make sure I got the right food at the right time. I exercise all the time. I go out and see people. And when I meet people, I try to get, get them in to talk. You know? I never pass anybody on the street without saying hi. And nine times out of ten, people stop and talk to you. I, I spoke to a counselor for a couple of years, and she's given me a great advice on what my attitude should be. And uh, I've listened to my therapist and really developed a rapport. Anytime I'm feeling down, I talk to her. And she's the most positive person in the world. So it's like my healthcare support system is the key to my whole life. You know, Jay really does seem like such a cool guy. God, he seems like such an optimist. Well, and he he is thankful he has Parkinson's because it's really changed his life for the positive, which which is a really interesting yeah. way to look at it. Well, and he talks so much about the strength and importance of community, and it sounds like that building that community has really been important to him in his life, and like you said, in some ways improved his life because he enjoys that community. Well, I find the the people that are thriving who have Parkinson's have strong community around them, uh, whether it's family, whether it's a work family, whether it's uh, exercise groups, support groups. You know, the, there's a team of people around them helping them get through each day, which. I think is is really key to you know living successfully with Parkinson's. So overall, would you say that boxing was a success? I own my own gloves now. Hey, yeah, but I don't use them, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I've not been back to class yet. But that's for two reasons. Number one, I wanted to try a few other things out okay. before committing, uh, and uh, they're always during the day. That's the you know the Parkinson's community hasn't really targeted a lot of things to people that are still in the workforce. Right. Um, Robin emailed me not long ago, and she may be adding a weeknight class next year. And so if, if, if there is a nighttime class, I'll probably sign up for that. So what else have you tried then? So we went from boxing to CrossFit. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. That sounds difficult. Do you remember Hillary? Yeah, of course. Yeah, she's the young woman that we talked to about anxiety. She had Parkinson's symptoms since she was 12. She's now 27, uh, diagnosed at 24. Well, she challenged me to join her for CrossFit. I love CrossFit. And I find I, jo- I didn't join CrossFit because of my Parkinson's. <laughs> I actually joined CrossFit because I saw a video of girls in booty shorts and sports bras doing rope climbs and I wanted to be like them. And now I am. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so I'm trying to imagine you in booty shorts and having a hard time doing it. I don't want to wear booty shorts or a sports bra, (laughs) but CrossFit does seem interesting, if not extreme. And it does seem to help Hill. I just actually feel like CrossFit has changed my life and made me... I don't know what I would be like without CrossFit having my diagnosis because I am able to push through a lot physically um, because I'm a lot stronger than I would have been. 
So Hillary invited me to Rain City Fitness, uh, where I met her trainer, Liz Carrier. So you may have the same question that I had, like, what is CrossFit? Yeah. That's a great question. It is can be a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but it is a strength and conditioning program that works on moving external objects, moving your body weight, working on your cardiovascular conditioning, working on moving odd objects, all of the above. I think most people probably associate it with like moving big tires and Absolutely. throwing things. Absolutely, I do that every day, every hour of the day. <laughs> yep, that's exactly how it works. Yep. Um, no, it's more about being able to move lots of different things. So whether that's a barbell or your own body weight through space, meaning like pull-ups and push-ups and things like that, all of that is important. Um, you, you're looking at me and you... Yep. I'm not really CrossFit shape. That's okay. Is that okay? Am I going to be Absolutely. Am I gonna survive? Or we am I will crazy? start with where you're at. Okay. Yeah, we're going to ride the bike. We're going to squat with just your body weight, and we'll go from there. All right. Yeah. Okay, Larry, I totally didn't think that she was joking when she said that she just flips tires around all day. I legitimately <laughs> thought she was being serious because I, too, associate CrossFit with those really strong people in sports bras and booty shorts who flip tires all day long. <laughs> well, it, 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 she she has a very, uh, let's say, sarcastic sense of humor, uh, which which is kind of endearing for a trainer because yeah. you want somebody who can, who can laugh with you. <laughs> well, uh, laugh while they're torturing you, right? While they're torturing you and making fun of you. Uh, no, she, she was very supportive. I was uh, waiting for Hillary to show up, you know, so we were just sort of passing time, and Liz said, uh, let's just begin without her. So the torture began. Okay, so I'm uh, about 10 minutes into this. I was stretching, and I'm already out of breath. This is not good. <laughs> now, I, I didn't do anything too extreme, Nikki. I uh, rode a cool-looking bike and did some squats on boxes with different kinds of weights. One looked like it weighed 100 pounds, but it really was like 10. <laughs> so, like, the pictures on Instagram were Super awesome. Super good, yeah. Uh, and I used some kettle weights, and I, I did work up a sweat. All right, so what did I just do? Um, so you did a workout where you biked, you did goblet squats, and you did step-ups. Go- go- what are go- goblet? goblet squats, where you hold a kettlebell out in front of you. We did some 8-kilo squats and some 12-kilo squats. Okay. How did I do? You did great. You squatted well. You moved the entire time, didn't complain, broke a sweat. I'm intimidated by the ropes on the wall. Yep, we're not using the ropes okay, on the wall right now. You. Yep. That's scary. <laughs> yep. All right. They're just an accessory. <laughs> they just make the gym look tough. <laughs> Goes with the concrete walls, Great. you know? Well, you know what, Larry? I got to say good for you because that is a really intimidating environment. It was, it was cr- like, there was lots of grunting and, you know, snatching up weights up sure, over your head. Yeah. And I'm like, we're not doing that, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> she goes, no, you need to work up to that. <laughs> in fact, th- she was telling me that I- in order to like, join a class, you have to do like an introductory training session just to learn the moves for like, you know, four or five sessions. Oh, wow. So it's like one-on-one training so you can learn the CrossFit moves so you do it safely so you're not just, they're not throwing you into the you know, lion's den. All right, and that's where they teach you how to use those crazy-looking ropes on the walls. Apparently, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After the workout, Hillary did appear, and, you know, that happens with people with Parkinson's. You know, everyone has great intentions, but you can only do what you can do on any given day. You arrive when you arrive. No big deal. And I caught her up on my CrossFit experience. Um, I can tell you, after doing CrossFit, mm-hmm. the f- at first... It wasn't physically difficult, but it was mentally difficult. Oh, totally. And with each rep, rep, it got physically more difficult and mentally easier. Yeah. Which which I found very fascinating. I love CrossFit because it has give, like, given me the opportunity to realize my potential, kind of. I, like, than I thought I was. I just have fun lifting weight and snatching. <laughs> I actually don't like lifting weight. It's a lie. I like doing cardio. <laughs> but that's where Liz is helping me with my strength. Good. So, she's amazing. <laughs> yeah, she is amazing. She was great. Mm-hmm. She put me through the ringer. Although, you're, you're, you're talking about, like, bouncing balls off the wall and snatching and, like, I just rode a bike and did some steps. That's not an easy bike, though. The Airdyne? Is yeah. that what she put you on? It's actually quite... It's death. <laughs> so, it's that's amazing that you did that, and I think it's awesome that you came in here today to try it out. This is like this is just my instinct to push and do CrossFit because I love doing CrossFit, and the second I feel better, 
I want to just keep pushing myself. But then I hear my friend telling me that her boyfriend's dad, who has Parkinson's, just sits on the couch all the time, which breaks my heart to hear that. I don't want to give up. So what did you like more? Because now we've heard that you did the boxing and we've heard that you did the CrossFit. Was there one that you preferred over the other? Uh, I think I, at this point I like the boxing better than the CrossFit. The yeah. CrossFit just is a, a – I'm just not that excited about <laughs> yeah. like the, the extreme nature of it. The boxing seems more up my alley for sure. I imagine after both, though, that – you were pretty sore. Oh, yeah, I was sore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought uh, at that point, after evaluating both, that I should go back to some basics. Mm. Uh, so I called up a physiotherapist. Her name is Naomi Casiro, and she specializes in working with people with Parkinson's. One, two, one, two. Can you hear that? Yeah. Two. So even that out. One, two, one, two. So she put me on a treadmill, one, Nikki. Two. And, you know, I've been walking my whole life, go. but at some point, my brain forgot how to do it on the right side of my body. So oh. my, my foot clomps, my arm doesn't swing when I walk. Huh. Those all sound like little things that we take for granted. I mean, anyone who's been to physio, I'm sure can relate, though, that it can be very frustrating if your body is not working the way that you just expect it to work. Well, well and it's awkward and it's embarrassing. Um, you know, I, I forgot that you had to do the heel to toe when you walk, oh, like, yeah, I guess. like, and then you have to think about it, and then when you think about it, your pace gets all off. So, we we really focused uh, on retraining my brain on how to walk properly again. So, as you come onto that foot, heel strikes come up onto that foot. It's like your heel lands and it drives your body up. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the second that heel strikes the floor, it's an it's a telltale sign to come up onto that leg, nice and strong. Yes, there we go. I tell people it's like walking your like you're walking down the aisle, right? That oh, nice. Yeah. And these were like forty five minute or hour long sessions where she taught me exercises I could do on my own, and she identified like certain sounds or like feelings in my feet that would alert my brain that I'm walking weird. So it wasn't that she she expected me to walk correctly a hundred percent of the time, but she wanted me to be aware or become conscious that I wasn't walking properly. Because as soon as that awareness comes, it means your brain is being retrained. Because for apparently years now, my brain didn't think anything of it. So on the treadmill, she had me walking and she, she wanted to hear the heel hit the mat. Oh, okay. And so, so, yeah. so I could hear my feet go do, 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 instead of do, do. Do, do, oh. do. So that's what we're, we're listening for. And that's, and so you want that, a more consistent rhythm and not this limpy rhythm. Right. So you're just listening for a rhythm. And we're dun, going super dun, slow. Dun. Like you get on a treadmill and, and you know, most people are getting it's up to a jog at some point. We're not even fast walking. Like this is like One really foot. slow because you're just trying yeah. to retrain your brain. Interesting. So it's, again, not something you have to think about all the time, but it's another cue just to tell your brain, oh, that sounds nice and even. I must be doing a good job of that, right? Or it sounds like I'm an elephant on one side and a (laughs) feather on the other, so we want to even that out a little bit, right? After a couple of sessions, I sat down with Naomi to discuss why physio is so important for people with Parkinson's. We know from the research that exercise is the only thing that's known to uh, truly mitigate disease progression and and really... uh, challenge the brain to change in a way that can change the symptoms longer term. And what do you work on? Like if somebody's never been through physio, it can be intimidating. Yeah, so um, our programs are very individualized. So um, it's really important to me to look at each client and what they're struggling with. We call Parkinson's the designer disease because everyone, you know, there's a whole gamut of symptoms and everyone has kind of different pieces and parts of all of those symptoms. So we really need to look at what people's challenges are, what they want to accomplish in their life, you know, what their goals are and set our programs accordingly. But really what we're doing is we do Parkinson's specific exercise to change the brain, which then changes the body. So when I walked in here, what did you see? 
Um, so when you walked in, uh, we talked immediately about, you know, things that were challenging for you and stuff like that. I knew a little bit about you from before and obviously um, you're somebody who is a go-getter and really wants to enjoy life and be able to do the things you want to do. So that was kind of a primary focus that I saw right away. Uh, I'm always, you know, from my physio standpoint, triggered to see things uh in you know gait and walking and, and biomechanics so immediately uh, I noticed that you know your gait was something that was challenging you and once I got my hands on and started actually taking a peek at what was going on I recognized what was starting to lead to that and that there was actually things that were being underutilized that could be improved there what does that mean <laughs> what does that mean it means that with Parkinson's there's very often um, there's something that we call kind of this motor weakness. You know, your muscles are there and they're they're ready to function, but the signals aren't getting through. And so with Parkinson's, when you have it, when you've been repeating patterns for a very long time, people often have symptoms, you know, a year or two before they get diagnosed. These patterns kind of are hidden in there and they start to creep up on you and your brain doesn't notice. And so if we can start targeting the things that are underlying that are they're there they just aren't being utilized they they really want to be woken up right it's like waking up those motor patterns then some often people's function improves drastically it just takes a little bit of poking and prodding to get those things working you actually flick my feet i flick your feet yes <laughs> so it's a facilitation technique to draw the brain's attention to an area of the body that's not working or woken up as much as it should be and start getting those motor patterns firing so we can improve naturally how much your brain pays attention to that area and sends those motor signals on a regular basis so we've had three sessions how am i doing you're doing great um you know luckily your body is very responsive to those facilitation techniques and you're very hard working and so have listened very carefully to the things i've told you i always tell people you know i can only do so much i can give you the information and i can give you the exercises but when it comes down to it you have to do the work and so you've been very good at that so far um and i think you're doing great it's um with parkinson's and exercises we very often do see those changes start to come out very quickly which is which is great because it's motivating right it's motivating to see your body changing and i think realize the potential people with Parkinson's I say are chronically under challenged in my opinion and feel often like they don't have control of what's happening to them so part of it is that you know you can see you can bring back a little bit of that control you do have some control over what your body does and how you move and and you know what exercises you can do to change that and things like that well the diagnosis is heavy it, it sort of weighs you down yeah and it sort of wraps you in a cocoon and you feel smaller and smaller and smaller and you're there there's this there's part of you that's just like, well, this is my lot in life, and there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. And then what you've shown me is that there is something you can do about it. Yeah, and I, it, it's really important to me that, you know, um, people with Parkinson's realize that they do have control, right? You don't have control over everything, but you have control over some things. And, uh, you know, our medical system, we have phenomenal neurologists in our city, but they're very, you know, overworked. They don't have a lot of time, so people get a diagnosis, and they get sent out the door. So one of the things that's really important to me is to sit down with people and listen to their story and hear what their goals are and create a program where they feel like they have control over those things and can actually be an active participant in their lives, right? You don't have to passively live with Parkinson's. You can be active and yes, Parkinson's comes along with you, but you can be, you know, the active driver, the person in the driver's seat. I'm newly diagnosed and I'm young onset, but is physio for somebody who's had it for 10 years and is well along the path yeah so i think you know generally i would say we can always do something the goals have to change depending on where you are in your um progression i ideally everyone gets sent to parkinson specific physiotherapy you know the day the week they are diagnosed it, the earlier we can address things the better but that, that's not always our system and the word doesn't always get out so yeah we we can definitely still treat people further down the line and i treat everyone from newly diagnosed to very very late in disease um, progression uh, and again it's just a matter of adjusting our goals and what we're working on but absolutely there's still treatment you know, what she said is absolutely true. You have to put in the work if you want to get results. So it's cool that she said, Larry, your body's responsive. And yes, you're putting in the work. So I think you're going to be successful with this. Yeah. Uh, that being said, uh, I was able to keep up with it for a while. And then Luna, our dog oh, that we talked about in yeah. the extra dosage episode, she came into our lives and I had no time or energy or focus for exercise. And then, like, you just sort of get out of that rhythm, and I 
canceled a couple of sessions with Naomi and now like, I need to get back on that schedule. And, and, and that's the hard thing. Like this, this isn't like a, I do it for six weeks and I, I'm good. This is I've got to figure out how to incorporate exercise into my life yeah. for the rest of my life. Like, I won't even commit to an apartment. Like, I won't even buy a house. <laughs> like, I have the only thing I've committed to for the rest of my life are my wife and my son. Yeah. Well, it's true because you kind of take life one day at a time, but you have to schedule now all of these new appointments into your very busy life. Yeah. It's uh, Parkinson's. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Parkinson's. That's, that's, it's my new reality. Uh, the other thing she did, you remember the walking stick I had from Jay? Yeah, of course. Yeah, she hates that. Oh, no. Because, <laughs> because it, it, I mean, she loves the pole, but what it doesn't help my walk right. be normal. So she gave me two poles. They're called urban poles. Uh, and and you, I use them for walking now around the city or getting around town. And it helps uh, keep my arms moving because I have to use both arms to, to to move the poles and it keeps my stride going and I can hear ah. when they're hitting the ground so the poles actually help with the sound so it's you know they're, they're making some cool stuff for us uh, and it also uh, you know I'm 46 I don't look like an invalid I don't look like I need a seat on the bus right. but if I have poles people are more likely to let me sit in the handicapped area because standing and trying to balance on a moving bus it is extremely a, is a difficult. big challenge. So the polls actually help sort of, it's a visual notification that there's yeah. something wrong here. That makes sense, actually. So it helps you in more ways than just one. Absolutely. Now, Naomi mentioned some research. Yeah, that, that's the research that uh, shows us that exercise is important for combating the progression of symptoms. Mm. But what is it about exercise? How much exercise do you do? How often do you do it? What, why exercise? Yeah. I have a lot of questions, Nikki. Yeah. So I went straight to the source. The doctor who did the research and wrote the paper on exercise and Parkinson's is Dr. A. John Stossel. He is the head of neurology and the co-director of the Center of Brain Health over at UBC, uh, University of British Columbia. You're the guy. You're the one. And probably all the world has been doing the research on <laughs> exercise and Parkinson's, telling me it's good for me. Why is exercise good for me? Well, we think exercise is important for many reasons. There's plenty of evidence in Parkinson's and in other conditions as well <clears throat> that exercise will help treat the symptoms of the moment. So motor function, balance, things like that improve. Importantly, exercise is also good for treating the aspects of Parkinson's that don't respond so well to medication. Things like cognition, mood, apathy. Apathy can be a big problem in uh, Parkinson's and it doesn't respond very well to most medications. So those are for the here and now, but the other uh, much more tantalizing aspect of this is that uh, evidence would suggest that exercise has an impact on the progression of Parkinson's. There are very few, in fact we don't have any medical treatments that have been shown to have an impact on disease progression. So we can treat the symptoms, but we don't end up treating the underlying disease. Exercise may actually be the way to do that. Do we know why? We don't. At this point, there are several suggestions. Uh, some of the things that we've been pursuing are that uh, exercise improves brain plasticity. It may actually help the brain rev up connections so that it the Different parts of the brain are talking better to other parts of the brain. We have a tantalizing suggestion that exercise may actually reduce abnormal levels of inflammation in the brain, but I think it's too early to, to know that for sure. Uh, but there are other lines of evidence that other we're not looking at this directly ourselves. There's been a lot of work suggesting that um, Exercise increases the levels of certain growth factors that are important for the survival and function, discrete function, of certain types of nerve cells. Uh, now, you can potentially try to give those growth factors as a medicinal treatment, but they don't actually easily cross the blood-brain barrier. So with exercise, you may be able to ramp up the levels in the brain. Now, when we talk about exercise, what kind of exercise are we talking so that's also not known for sure. There is some controversy as to whether the focus should be on aerobic exercise or resistance training, like weights and so on. I think in general, probably the preponderance of evidence suggests that aerobic exercise is important. 
although perhaps some combination is, uh, of the two is better than either alone. And as for whether it's cycling, running, treadmill, uh, you know, what have you, I personally doubt that it's that important which one you pursue. The more important thing is to actually do it. And so that's why it's important, as, uh, as I tell people, is to do what you hate the least. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, it's no good somebody prescribing you half an hour on the treadmill every day if you will never get on a treadmill. So uh, how much do you have to do to be effective? Well, um, we think probably half an hour a day, uh, four days a week. Uh, probably, you know, people who do more, that's probably better. Can doing you do an less. hour a day for two days a week? <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably not quite as good. I'm not an expert on uh, exercise physiology. I'm trying to negotiate fewer times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you're bargaining with the devil here. So. I know. <laughs> um, I would say it's more important to do some than to do none. So one of the weird things, and my wife and I talk about this all the time, is like when I exercise, I, I don't get that euphoria that everybody talks about. Like I, there's, I don't end yeah. my exercise going, whew, I feel good. I end going, God, that hurt. So you've raised a really interesting question, for a question that for me is scientifically very interesting, which is uh, the, this whole issue of the reward that people perceive from exercise, and I think you're right. I think there are people who get the so-called runner's high and so on, and um, there may be different makeup. I think some people are more prone to get reward from certain activities. Uh, some people may release more opiates. Some people may release more dopamine in the brain uh, in response to exercise. And we were actually quite interested in looking at the perceived benefits, the self-perceived benefits of exercise as opposed to, if you will, the real benefits, the hard measurable benefits. And we'd actually tried to design a study a few years back to look at that. It's a bit of a complicated design. Yeah. I know it doesn't impact me physically the same way it does other people, where my, my reward center is not the same, but it, does exercise impact the everybody with Parkinson's the same, or is that yet to be decided? I don't think we know that, but I think it's fair to assume that everybody stands to derive some benefit from exercise. So even if you don't uh, think it's the most enjoyable thing that you've ever done, um, I think you would still derive benefit, both physical and mental, from exercise. Uh, Dr. Sossel, thanks so oh, much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. In each episode of When Life Gives You Parkinson's, Larry takes a moment to chat with his wife, Rebecca. So I see today you signed up for yoga at the Impact Parkinson's. I did. And you invited me to join you. And I and have yet to <laughs> respond. <laughs> this like, is the first we've talked about it. Oh, yeah. Okay, I need to make that commitment to changing my attitude towards exercise. I saw an opportunity. I was available and I'm trying to do more things and try different things to keep my body moving and stay fit. And I love yoga. And this was Parkinson's focused balance, mindfulness focus, as all yoga is, really. But because it was connected to that community and everything, I was like, oh, well, you know, this is a good opportunity to kind of stay in that so, world and then invite my husband. Perhaps he'll join us. So, so. <laughs> So my initial reaction is the reaction that I'm battling, which is, oh, but I've got work and I've got things to do and I blah, blah, blah. And it's what I talked to my counselor about. And I'm like, okay, so what I've been trying to do as I sort through this new world in my head is I've got my life. It's established. It's great. It's perfect. I got my wife. I got my kid. So I got my home life taken care of. I've got my work life taken care of. I know what I like when I leave for work in the morning. I know when I come home. And I'm trying to squeeze in Parkinson's things throughout. And in 2019, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, okay, blank slate. We're going to reschedule Larry's life. I'm going to look at my calendar to see if I can make it fit this time around. Mm -hmm. But I, I commit to you that I will do yoga with you in 2019 at least once. Okay. And it's bigger than just I don't want to do it. I'm, I need to get over this energetic block that I've created around exercise and about how my definition of Larry is that it doesn't include exercise. Yes, and you let that become part of your... My story. Your story and your identity and your programming and, and that your body is something that you live despite. Right. 
rather than allowing your body to work for you and be super healthy and fit and let you function in a way that's really comfortable and stronger and more capable and comfortable than it has been for most of your most of this lifetime for you and it's easier for me to say well that's just the way i am instead of Mm -hmm. taking ownership of protecting my vessel what do you think has kept you from taking ownership of your body and letting your body be something that is a source of freedom and capability rather than something that now is even a disability. If I blame my body and not myself, then I am absolved of responsibility for the way I look, the way I feel, the way I am, because it's my body's fault, not my fault. Okay. So it's a body image thing. Yeah. At least in part. Because I've always, you know, since the third grade, I've been on a diet and off of a diet and onto a diet and off of a diet and onto a diet. Like, I've always had these body issues. And then, as I was telling Nikki earlier, you know, my brothers and my sister were athletic, and mm-hmm. that's how they were identified. And, mm-hmm. and then I was their little brother who was not the athlete. And that's their thing and not my thing, and so I'm not that for sure, even when it negatively impacts my health. Right, but what's really interesting is that anybody who's ever been in a drama program or worked as an actor or even a musician or anyone in the arts in that way, your body and taking ownership of your body and feeling comfortable in your body and being able to use your body, being at least somewhat fit well, and, and capable singer. of movement and right and breath and, and yeah. all of that. That's a huge part of the craft. Every time I performed, and I was performing as, as somebody else. I was escaping myself to play a role. What I may have to do to start is play the role of the guy who likes to exercise. Until I like to exercise. Fake it till you make it? Yep. What I observe, what I see, is that coming to terms and coming to a place of not embracing the disease, but embracing the body and the experience that you have in your body, even with the complications and the frustrations and the difficulties and the pain and and all those things that are not pleasant, but coming to a place where you can really love and embrace what the body offers you is part of your journey. And I just want you, I think I'll just sit that there because I don't know that you have answers. I definitely don't have answers. No, I don't. For that. But it seems to me that's part of your journey with this disease. I take your nugget and I place it in my brain (laughs) where Parkinson's will eat it. (laughs) No, it won't. But Parkinson's (laughs) wants you to look at it. Okay. (laughs) Uh, I love you. I love you too. Because early management of Parkinson's with medication is very effective and symptoms are controlled at the beginning, patients are often lulled into a false sense of security and don't start exercising until late in the progression of the disease, when it's already taken a physical toll. Parkinson Canada recommends regular exercise for all people with Parkinson's, regardless of how far along you are. It's never too early or too late to start exercising. Coming up on the next episode of When Life Gives You Parkinson's. Research, unfortunately, wouldn't happen, I don't think. Um, Certainly not at the pace it's going uh, without people, uh, basically the general public, providing funds. And here we are at a fundraiser called Forage for Parkinson's. Mm. I'm Emily Chambers and I'm the creator of Shake Shake Shake. There are people that are only an arm's length away from us that are dealing with these diseases. And how cool that we can give back in a fun way. As long as I have my voice, I'm going to tell my story. I'm a gene hunter. 
and we're going to take uh, some of the cells from your cheek. We spin that material down, we extract out the DNA, we shred it into a billion tiny fragments, and we sequence each of those fragments. We take all the information and using computers align it to a reference human gene to try and identify one specific difference that may be causal for your disease. Thank you for listening. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and you can do that on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this right now. And while you're there, please give the show a rating and a review. Feel free to comment too. We love your feedback. We do enjoy your feedback and it's a real simple way to help spread the word and raise awareness around Parkinson's disease. You can also engage with us on social media. It's at Parkinson's Pod on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Or email us, parkinsonspod at curiouscast.ca. Keep positive. Keep exercising. And keep listening. We'll talk to you next time. Canada may be known for its landscapes and friendly people, but beneath the surface lies a darker side of crime, history, and the paranormal. Since 2017, the award-winning Dark Poutine podcast has explored the shadowy corners of the Great White North and beyond, delivering chilling tales from a uniquely Canadian perspective. Hosted by Mike Brown and Matthew Stockton with over 300 episodes and fresh releases every Monday, Dark Poutine is your weekly ticket to the creepier side of Canada. Listen to Dark Poutine on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts.